Um, uh, Tara, might you begin by introducing yourself, um, what your role is, then we go down and invite the other two witnesses to identify themselves, and then we'll begin with Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Tara Smith. I'm the Finance Director for Central Services and DWP. Good morning. I'm Peter Schofield. I'm the Permanent Secretary at DWP. Morning. I'm Nick Joycey. I'm the Finance Director General at DWP. So, uh, as, a, as a rule, Peter, will you actually take the questions and then delegate it yeah, to no, one that's fine. Is that all right? Yeah, happily. Very good. Um, Chris? Good morning. Um, the 2015 spending review set out over half a billion uh, of cuts to the department's running costs uh, for the financial year 2019-20. So can I ask firstly, Peter, uh, do you believe the department's on track to meet this reduction? Well, that's a really good question. Thank you, Mr Stevens, for, for the question. Um, I think this becomes a challenge, uh, an increasing challenge, the further away we get from the year that the spending review settlement was set. So, as you say, it was the 2015 spending review, uh, which was in November 2015, with three years on from that. Uh, and, uh, and the challenge becomes greater the further you are away from the year that the plans were set. I would say a number of things. Um, as you say, there is a, a reduction. I think the reduction is actually 600 million between the current year uh, and next year in terms of our Dell funding. Uh, and I'd say a number of things. Some of the things have gone in our favour. Uh, so the way that the plans were set in 2015 uh, took account of the fact that in the early years of the spending review we were investing in some significant change programmes. Uh, and those change programmes, investment falls away. And some of those change programmes were to deliver policy uh, changes, some were to deliver uh, improvements in, uh, in service, uh, but some of them were also there to deliver savings in our uh, ongoing running costs. So what you see is uh, the investment falls away and then you get the uh, financial savings coming through. So one great example of that is the uh, People and Locations programme, uh, which we have been taking forward ever since our 20-year contract with Telereal Trillion for the buildings and estates uh, costs of DWP came to an end uh, in March of this year. So we had an investment of around 300 million last year, a little bit more investment in the current year. Uh, but going forward, we make savings of uh, something like £140 million on average per year over the uh, next 10 years. So you've got some... The property company is getting less money out of you, is that right? Well, a number of things. So, so basically we were, the contract, it was a 20-year contract, so it was signed in March 1998, or came into a force 1st of April 1998. And over a period of time, so our need for space has reduced, but we were locked into uh, the, the leases that we had. And then the second thing is it's like a big black box of contracts, a PFI contract. You make a unitary payment uh, through uh, each year. Uh, but the supply chain is invisible to us as the customer. So what we're able to do uh, now that the contract has come to an end, we've got much more flexibility in our leases. So generally, instead of locked in for 20 years, we've signed up to normally 10-year leases with a five-year lease break. But also, we contract separately for the supply chain. For, so whether it's security guards, <coughs> facilities management, uh, capital works, so we're able to drive competition through the supply chain. And it's those factors that drive out the savings of something like £140 million. Pounds. So, you have, so um, things in our favour, sorry, are, um, are first of all the profile uh, was reflected. And the second thing is, and people in location is an example of that, we have been terrifically good at driving savings from third party suppliers. So something like almost a half, it's just under £3 billion pounds of our Dell, is spent with third-party suppliers. And we have a fantastic commercial team uh, that we have built up over the last few years. And I think our annual report and accounts showed savings of about £315 million in third-party suppliers in 1718. In the current year, we're targeting about £250 million. And the same again in 1920. And the thing about commercial savings is that they build up. So the savings that we got in the first year, they're there in the second year, and then you add two and add two. So it's a, an accumulation. To be clear, you don't always drive budget savings from those commercial savings, uh, because sometimes you get a better price and we go out and buy more volume. So converting that into those numbers into cash is always a challenge. But even in the current year, we're aiming for something like 60 to 70 percent change. So anyway, there are some things going in our favour. Uh, there are things that, make, that, that become more difficult 
so for example, as I said at the beginning, we had planned for change programmes to be front-end loaded and to be the investment to be falling away in future years. And that hasn't always been possible. People and locations it has. Uh, give you another one. Um, the reassessment of cases from uh, DLA to PIP, which we'd planned to finish in the current year at the time of the spending review. But last year we slowed the reassessments down, uh, really to, to drive better quality outcomes from our suppliers. Uh, we were concerned about some issues around consistency. So we took volumes down and gave the challenge to our suppliers to, to deal with, uh, get, to get consistency uh, improved. Um, so the result of that is that we're continuing but to might do... Might you ask Chris, answer Sorry. Chris's question? Yeah. Are you going to meet that target? Um, well, uh, we've got channel, the things in our favour, things going against us, and there are uncertainties. And the reason why I can't answer that right now is because of some of the uncertainties that we have. And the biggest uncertainty at the moment is in terms of uh, volumes. <coughs> so what we always do at this stage in the year, once we've got the OBR forecast for uh, economic growth going forward, we can then start the process of translating that into workload and into the number of people that we need, which fill, fits into our recruitment. And to give you a, a sense you of the flow, well, number, number of claimants. Yeah. Sorry, number of claimants. Sorry, yes, yes, right. yes sorry, well, sorry to be clear. <coughs> yes. So to give you an example of that, no, sorry, sorry. Sorry, if you are uncertain, and yeah. back to the chair's point on property then. Yeah. Uh, one of the decisions the department's taken, which is a fairly controversial one, was the closure of job centres. So is the department looking to close more job centres, or is it... No. The, or is it now no, 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 no. State secure? no, no, it's done. It's done. The, the decisions are done. And we so we signed up to, by and large, um, the shape of our estate at, at the point where the Telereal Trillium contract finished, um, it was Easter Saturday, I remember it well, Easter Saturday uh, back in March. Um, so we then signed up to leases for all our buildings going forward. And most of them, as I say, are 10 year leases with a five year lease break. There are some transitional sites where it may be three years, but it carries us all the way through uh, the period that we're talking about. But crucially, it gives us the opportunity to look again at our estate in the run up to 2023. So more flexibility going forward. Um, but to give you an idea of sort of some of the movements we can see at this stage in the year, um, I remember sitting behind my predecessor, Robert Devereux, uh, at the Public Accounts Committee, which was the autumn, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was, but I think it was the autumn, it was the autumn of last year. Uh, and at the time, uh, coming out of a planning round, we felt we had a gap of about £340 million for the year we're in now. Uh, we then did work around volumes for following the budget last year. We were in a position, position to set a balanced budget for 1819, the year that we're in. Uh, so volumes moved in the right way, I mean, in part because of the uh, success in the labour market. We saw the latest statistics yesterday. Um, but but um, Peter, it's still like, not clear. Are you yeah. going to meet the target? Well, the answer is we're right in the middle of the planning at the moment. So there's so uncertainty. So you don't know? So I don't know because we need to finish our planning work. Okay, if we, uh, if we move on to... Sorry. Yes, Nigel, I'm slightly nervous about that, Mr Schofield, because I mean, we're six months from the start of the 2019-20 financial year. And presumably you need to have those savings locked in for the start of the year, otherwise it gets quite difficult to make a half a billion saving halfway through a year because you're going to make a billion. So you, you really sat there saying, well, we just don't know. Or are you... No, and that's not... That. So, so I know where we are in the planning process, and I know the work that we've done, and, then, and we have we have options uh, looking forward into into nineteen twenty. All I'm saying, it, it's not that I don't I don't know in the sense of there's a huge amount of uh, lack of clarity in the, the numbers coming through. It's that the all I'm saying is that the volume data coming out of so the number of claims coming out of the work we do following the OBR forecast can change the position quite significantly. You've got a budget for next year of 5.4 billion of resource, Dell, haven't you? Are you going to hit that budget? 5.8 billion if you include capital as well, yes. Um, uh, well, I think that's the question that the Chair was asking me earlier. And my point is, it's a challenge. I know what we can do. I know the things that we're working on. We have an open set of discussions with the Treasury, as you would expect at this time of year. Uh, and, um, and it will be a challenge but we will do everything we can uh, to live within the Dell. So you send, your, you send your Secretary of State into the House of Commons saying, no idea, really? What are we, we are, no, that's not what I said. Uh, we're going to do our sure. best, but we don't know. No. Well, well, as Nigel said, six months away. 
And that's not what I and that's that's not what I said. What I'm saying is that we're in the middle of the planning process at the moment. There are things moving in our favour, uh, and we 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 set we set the final budget for uh, 1920 in our winter planning round, which we finalise in in the new year. So we'll finalise our budgets in January, and we'll set our plans on the basis of that. So just so we're clear, is it a known unknown or an unknown known? Or a further unknown unknown. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, uh, what I would say is that there are lots of things that we're doing to drive down the cost of running the department, uh, and there are some there are some uncertainties which flow as 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 they always do at this stage in the financial year. Yeah, yeah. So, what's the range? I mean, I don't know, sat here now, whether you think you might hit five point four or you might hit seven. I mean, you, you, it's the range. You might it might be five and a half. It might be five point six, but hopefully we can get to 5.4 or is the range much higher than that? Um, I would say um, so, so as I said this time last year the, um, the work that we did after we got the volumes through moved things by something like £340 million pounds. so there's considerable movement on that but look, we start with a gap well, of six hundred. More cost or less cost? Well, sorry, it depends on the. So in that case, it came down. Came down. In that case, it came down. And given the success in the labour market, given yesterday's statistics, uh, I would hope for continuing good news uh, on that front. But alongside everything that I've said, let's remember these continuing savings in third-party spend, and then I have flexibility around what we do in terms of investment timing of investment plans, so I can see the right. stuff wants to come in. Just, just yes. For the sake of clarity, you're definitely saying that there are no plans to close any more job centres yeah. at the moment or going forward for the next couple of years? Yeah, no, no plans. Okay. No, no, no plans other than anything that's been announced, but, but that's where we are, absolutely. Okay. Okay. That, will relief, well, that, that, that will be a relief to many people, yeah. uh, and I think we've noted that. But let, let, let's now go on to known knowns then, to, uh, to use Mr Crow's phrase. Um, and and uh, turn to uh, <laughs> universal credit. Um, so can you tell us then, Mr Schofield, have you, have you achieved the level of automation of universal credit that's necessary to deliver the savings required to meet the 2019-20 limit? The 2018-19 limit? Yes. 2019-20. 2019-20. Yeah. Um, there's further automation. I mean, basically we're dropping in more releases, more automation releases uh, every two weeks. Uh, so we'll continue to do those every two weeks going forward. So if your question is, have we dropped in all the automation that we're planning to do ahead of 1920, then no, because we'll continue to do those. Um, but the other point to take into account, which I would emphasise on universal credit, and it came out in the NEO report, is that a lot of the way that we drive efficiency in universal credit, drive unit cost reduction in, unit, in universal credit, comes from the way that the caseload mix changes as we bring more volumes through. So two things in that. One is it's a digital platform. The more people who come onto universal credit, so the unit cost comes down kind of automatically. And then the second thing is, as we bring more people into universal credit, so for example, fewer of the people on universal credit are in the first assessment period, with, which is when there's an awful lot of uh, administration, a lot of work to be done. So, so, so it drives unit costs down. So, so, in, in layman's terms, every delay to bringing more people on cost, will cost the department more money and affects this uh, threshold, yeah? Uh, sorry. If, if we you, don't, you, so you're saying that the more people are on it, the cheaper it gets to run. So, the longer it takes to move people on, the more it costs to deliver. So I'm talking <laughs> about unit costs. So you then have to multiply time. unit costs by the number of people to get the total cost. So that makes it a bit more complicated. But there are two ways, aren't there, yeah. what, uh, what Neil's yeah. saying? One is we know lots of people go into universal credit and we get cuts in benefit. Mm -hmm. So that's a saving. The alternative is, of course, you work, you put into your calculations that each tranche of people moving onto universal credit will Sorry. give you administrative Sorry. savings. <laughs> yes. I, I was focusing very much on the second because I thought the conversation is no, about no, the sure. environmental right. expenditure limit. But any slowdown that the government comes up with will cost you more money. Well, both on admin and both that the claimants will get higher benefits for longer. 
let me take those two points in the context. So where we are now, because I think we're focusing on 2019-20, yeah. and that is the crucial thing. So in 2019, so we finished the rollout to every job centre in December. So that means that all new claims into, into working age are into universal credit. So what you'll see then, and I'm, let's how put managed a, migration to one and side. And how big a important. task will that be? To complete mi manage migration, uh, to no, complete no, no. the rollout. The, sorry. the actual, the the you're during this period, you'll have completed establishing it in every job centre. Plus, yes. How many claims, new claims, as opposed to legacy historic claims? But how many new claims will you therefore have to do during that period onto universal credit? Okay, so we're currently at about 1.2 million people on universal credit. And that will then rise to around about uh, 2 million in May next year. And by the end of nine, uh, 2019, it'll be around 3 million. So, so that's my point, really. Put managed migration to one side. The fact that we have rolled out universal credit to every job centre by the end of this year means that all new claims are coming in. It. And that builds, that builds volumes up quite to, apart up from Up to 3 migration. million. Yeah. Um, so that you're going to have your work cut out just doing that, aren't you? Well, this thing plays... Sorry, Miss George. No, but, but you're oh, should I finish the question? I was Okay, no, no, sorry. Um, that's no, a but, mega, mega, mega job in itself, isn't it? Oh, no, I, I absolutely agree. It's a, it's a huge challenge, uh, which is why we... Without been, any transfer of legacy. So it's a huge challenge, but it plays into, I think, the points that colleagues um, were, were asking about uh, already, which is around unit costs. My, my point would be, I see unit costs falling over the coming period because of the increase in volumes in the way that we've described. And indeed, unit costs have already come down quite significantly. So the National Audit Office published their report only in June, and they had a figure of unit costs, if I remember rightly, of something like £699. The current number is 545 That's just here we are on the 17th. And it was supposed to be 173 is that correct? Was no, that it was supposed to be about 505 at this stage. Uh, it, uh, the, the 173 number is ultimately when we're in steady state. Uh, and the 573 is not but the these are not, But if you've got, say, 100 claims now, and the unit cost is t uh, 2, and then you get 200 claimants, and although there's a reduction in the unit cost, you're saying, hmm. the actual total cost goes up. Yes, but of course, this is reducing, we're also seeing reduced volumes into our legacy benefits. So we're able to migrate. So one of the things we're doing an awful lot of at the moment is moving uh, many of our service centres into currently doing uh, ESA new claims, uh, for example, or Job Seekers Allowance new claims. We're moving them into universal credit. So we're moving people over. We're training them up and equipping them and enabling them to be ready for that. So we are, we're, we're ready. I don't, I, I uh, don't see the... I don't yeah, see we've got the, lots and lots of questions. We'll be coming back to that, sure. Peter. Fine. Chris, are you happy for us to move on? Uh, yes. Sorry. On All right. Thank you. Um, the delay to managed migration will obviously um, prevent those, uh, some of those 3 million people who will be moving over uh, by the end of 2019 from re receiving any transitional protection for doing so. Are, is, is that one of the calculations within the departmental budgets on the lack of transitional protection? Because I've been quite um, quite uh, shocked, I must say, by the low level of budgeting for that transitional protection, particularly in uh, in the OBR's report. I thought you said, Peter, your three million was going to be people who would have been getting JSA. Yes. People coming on, yes. new, yes. nothing, nothing, nothing to do with those who are on legacy benefits now. Um, unless they, well, as change you know, unless they've had a change, change of circumstances that triggers a new claim, Claims. which obviously into universal right. credit. So that would be, and that then would be the point. point. Therefore, are they going to be protected? Um, so we've announced the protection for people with severe disability premium, as you know. Um, but no, I mean, one of the. the the, the, I mean, we're bringing, we'll be bringing, the government will be bringing regulations for managed migration and transitional protection uh, to Parliament shortly. Of course, the advantage of moving uh, managed migration and, and moving forward with managed migration is it locks in the transitional protection that you've described. Now, transitional protection in the context of our DEL budget 
is, is less relevant. This, this is scoring in, in Amy. Uh, so back to the context of the earlier discussion, it's not the issue. Uh, but you're right, the, the three billion of, of um, managed uh, migration uh, transitional protection is there for people when we manage migrate. Uh, so Whenever that, you do it, great. Qu quick one, yeah, well, yeah, well, then we're going to go on to raising yeah, that. Yeah, I think the expectation is about 80% of claimants will be able to verify identity online. Uh, and the NEO report said it was only achieving about half of that. Yeah. Where is that at now? Uh, I think it's around. I mean, not. I, I think the NAO. Uh, you're, you're very generous about what the NAO might have said. I think the NAO were more like about a third of it. I think we're around 37 uh, percent. Um, Still so, now. Yes. So that figure hasn't changed. Uh, no, not not significantly. No, no. Because Nigel's got quick. <laughs> uh, and then Chris has this. back to Chris. Yeah, Nigel. I was going to ask Mr. Scarfield. I, I, I'd have. I'd have thought you might have come in here and made a pitch for some more money and said, look, the, the key to making this all work, actually, is we need to have more resource on the ground. If we can give people better support, we can get a better outcome, we can reduce the Amy spend of £160 billion a year, and actually every answer we get from ministers is we're going to have more support for this, more support for that. If we can give individual claimant commitments, that really helps. If we can support them through the journey, that really helps. I mean, are you... Is that what you're asking for behind the scenes to say, actually, if we're going to get this right and do a really good job, actually these savings are directionally a bad idea, we should be spending to save here, and if we can get the quality up, actually we can save you some of your 160 billion rather than a penny pinching on the 5.4 So Peter, billion. are you, with your um, statement so far, strengthening the Treasury's hand against your Secretary of State when she goes in to ask for more money? <laughs> That's Nigel's. No, I know. Nigel's I understand. Question. I understand so what Mr. Mill's uh, question. And um, uh, look, we're less than a week and a half away from that. No, we're more than a week and a half. We're less than two weeks away from the budget. I can see. Still do my uh, my arithmetic, and you can imagine conversations are going on uh, with the Treasury. I think every department is having conversations with the Treasury. And I can't, uh, I can't speculate on that. But what I would say, and, and this is really, I think this is an important point to get across. And it comes out, I think, clearly in the business case for universal credit, uh, which we published early in the year. I think in response to um, the, the committee asking us to, to do that, there is a lot of recycling of savings into support for claimants. So the um, the business case that shows 300 million pounds of gross administrative savings. And 200 million of that gets reinvested into support in the front line in job centres. So, Peter, so you're not going to help your Secretary of State by making, answering Nigel's question that you do need more money. <laughs> you're going to send her into the conference chamber naked, are you? <laughs> <laughs> the classic term of Naira and Bevan? Yes? I do everything I can to support my Secretary of State. And but my you, won't make a, you won't answer Nigel's question. Well, I, I go back to the answer. Sorry, I, I go back to the answer I gave the committee. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like you've been coached, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we're, a, uh, we're a year from a spending review, I think, aren't we? That's due to come round next year. Yeah, maybe not. I mean, what is your vision for the department? Are you, are you saying, actually, we've now got as efficient and as small as we possibly can and actually if you want to deliver the policies that you want to deliver you know this is it now in actual fact we should put more resource in or are you thinking that your department could take a further round of efficiency savings without it really impacting the front line well we've been doing a lot of work about thinking about our, our vision for the next um, five years uh, as you can imagine uh, over the last uh, period of time ahead of a spending review, which we imagine will be, yeah, maybe this time next year, maybe maybe the summer next year, we're, we're, we're not sure. Um, but I think there are three broad things that are coming out of this for us. I mean, one, I mean, in a world in which the challenge will always be, and I'm realistic about this as a public servant, I'm realistic that the challenge will always be to drive greater efficiency and continue to deliver uh, improved levels of service. I'm, I'm realistic that we're, that's the challenge that we're being given. Um, but I think there are three things that for me are coming out of the work we've done so far. One is the opportunity to use uh, automation and digital in all its different forms to help us to do uh, more uh, without having uh, the sort of face-to-face -face or person-to-person contact. And there's some first fruits of that already. 
we've done some wonderful work in our pensions uh, teams on something called Check Estate Pension. We've now done uh, 10 million members of the public have contacted us to check their state pension records. They can do all of that online without having to speak to us directly. And, and obviously, with Universal Credit, there's more opportunity for our claimants to interact with us digitally. So, so I'm seeing you, the opportunity for. Are you for saying that you'll be sending your Secretary of State into these negotiations and saying, <coughs> don't worry, we can actually make further savings? Oh, no, I, I, say, I, I had three points. Should I, should I, sorry, I, I thought I'll try you had way the three. No, 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 that was, that was partly through number one. I'm really oh sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number two. <laughs> <laughs> I know we should all be looking at watch, sorry. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so the first is the opportunity for automation we, to take some of the heavy yeah, lifting. Number two. The second one is that increasingly, I mean, the number of customers, the number of claimants, the number of, me of members of the public that we will serve is going to go up in the future yeah. rather than going down. It goes up for two main reasons. One is dem demographics, more people on the state pension. And the second is with universal credit, we bring people in from legacy benefits from HMRC or, or local authorities. Sure. And, and increasingly, we see a greater mix of people with um, complex needs. So it matters for me that well, as we use automation to um, do some of the heavy lifting and uh, enabling people to, those who can, to interact with us digitally, so we can provide a more tailored support for those people uh, for whom that is the right way to serve them. And to do this on a case management basis. So in the past, DWP, I think, has been delivering many of its services through kind of national telephony. You know, you phone up and you get through to someone, but it might be a different person from the person you phoned last time. But Peter, Nigel didn't ask you that question. He asked you, when we get into the spending round, are you briefing the Secretary of State to go in and take more cuts on admin or that given the increased workload despite IT and all the rest of it, you're actually going to ask for more staff, well, more I, resources. I'm, I think I'm, I'm, asking for, I'm asking for a rebalance. I was going to f so that was my second point, a more tailored support. So rebalancing, a bit in the way we've done for Universal Credit. So I think Universal Credit is a good example of that. We've ta we're taking £100 million pounds uh, in steady state out of the admin costs of universal credit, but that's 300 million of uh, efficiency savings and 200 million of reinvestment. Been so successful, the Secretary of State's been up to it before the House Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, but never mind. Go on. Um, the third point I would mention is, is I think, what I've described as uh, really focusing in on planning and resourcing uh, in a more flexible way. Uh, so, um, two elements to that, going on driving out value from commercial uh, contracts in the way we've been doing. You know, as I say, each of these savings accumulates and we can keep doing 250 a Peter, year. We understand all of that. I mean, if this goes on, the Treasury won't understand what you're asking for. Believe you me, I don't know what's going on, what, what, you, <laughs> what, what the brief would be. I mean, maybe they just give up, give up and say, oh, well, we'll do what you want. But we're not even clear with what, what you actually want. But quick one from um, Chris and then... To, to Rosie and Nigel. Okay, then, so you've given that uh, the benefit processing teams and customer satisfaction levels are decreasing uh, and certainly decreased uh, compared to uh, previous year this year. How do you plan to ensure that the department's performance improves and further given uh, as your resources appear to be decreasing? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a good question, Mr. Stevens, and I think there are two elements to that, uh, to the answer. One is about, around, I mean, you know, resourcing makes a difference clearly, but I think there are two other elements. One is around uh, the way we plan and uh, allocate uh, work to our people. Uh, and then the second is around driving better performance from our contractors. So I can talk about both of those. I mean, one of the big impacts on our processing times, as the annual report and accounts uh, shows last year, was in state pensions when we had peaks in inflows, we had peaks in cl people claiming at particular points in the year. Now we should never be surprised by people claiming the state pension, but because we invite, we enable people to claim, you know, four months in, adv in advance of them reaching state pension age, sometimes you get an inflow in the way that you're not expecting. So actually being more um, uh, savvy in the way that we invite 
people to claim for state pensions could make a big difference. The volumes, I mean, this, because this is where there's huge numbers of, of volumes, huge numbers of, of people uh, claiming. So that's one thing. And the second thing is about driving better performance from our suppliers. I mean, let's be clear about that. That's one of the reasons why we slowed uh, the, uh, the reassessment of DLA but those contractors have never met the quality standards yeah. set by the department. We've yeah. heard that on this committee. So I, I don't no, understand we, your point. They're not meeting the standards. They're still uh, undertaking the assessments, and the department is still paying millions. And paying millions for the appeals and mandatory reconsiderations as a result of the failure to get them to meet their quality standards. So uh, the question I was asked was around improvements. And, and you're right, Mr Coyle, that, you know, uh, Maximus, uh, for example, who do the WCA uh, assessments have, have not got their, I mean the particular contract metric is um, having A and B graded reports being above 95%. They, which they've never met. Okay. Which, they, which they've never met, but they are, in, they are improving uh, and we're driving performance on that and we have massively reduced waiting times because there's less people well, well, going through the system. Give us evidence that they're actually improving. Because any time that we've <coughs> investigated the, the performance okay, of well, the I'll contractors, they haven't, made, they haven't made the simple All right, we'll get Peter, the last word to you, and then we must move on to the Sorry. next section. Sorry. Well, so, so my, yeah. my point, and I won't go into any more detail, but my point is the way that we, uh, to answer Mr. Stevens' question in terms of, of uh, performance, uh, is being better at managing the workload as it comes in. State pensions is my example of that, and being and driving better performance from suppliers. And and my point, my point, Mr. Cole, was more that we are they are significantly better than they were. So it's this. I was answering With the question. a much lower number of people, people, people going through. through. Going through All right, process. we must move on, Rosie. Oh, thank you. I could go on about performance by those for ages, but I won't get distracted. <laughs> okay, we're moving on to talking about tackling fraud and error in terms mm. of sort of financial. Yeah. Targets. So, are you on target to realise the 1.3 million per yeah, annum yeah. reductions in fraud and error that you set out in your case for universal credit? Um, well, we are, but it's early. All I would say is it's early days because the um, we're, we're moving to scale. I mean, part of this comes from uh, the way that we move to scale uh, in universal credit, and we bring more people onto the digital system, and we can use the digital processes to drive out uh, fraud and error. So the number of 1.3 bi uh, billion, as you say, it's in the business case uh, for universal credit, and we're very confident in it. Uh, but there is, th there's, there's work to be done. And we, we're, doing, we're doing a lot of, I mean, I can talk a little bit more about how we're tackling fraud and error, if that's helpful. Well, there are a few no, no. supplementary questions that go with that. Right. So okay. how does it square with the over overpayments due to mostly error, I would say, in our experience, under universal credit? Um, given that it, that's estimated to be running at 7.2% of spending, which is higher than any other benefit. Yes, but the measurement in the 2017-18 year was based on the live service, which is the manually based service. Uh, right. So a lot of the performance comes from the digital service, which is the thing that we're rolling out now. Okay, so do you have any evidence that that's going to be reduced significantly when when it's a full, you know, so how's that going to change? Yeah, no, so it's a good question. So what we are doing, so um, we made a number of changes into our fraud and error work over the last 18 months, bringing all of our fraud and error work under a single director who can see the whole process end to end. Uh, so we've got both investigators, the policy people, the strategy people, the change programme all together. And what we've asked them to do is to, what I described actually at the Public Accounts Committee uh, only a few months ago, as a heat map. Uh, so what we've done is, for every benefit, we have been we've looked at what is the cause of um, overpayment or indeed underpayment uh, by each of those uh, benefits. So the categories like, you know, have we got the earnings right, uh, or in PIP, you know, has there been a change in the condition of the claimant? You know, hopefully positive, maybe worsening. Um, uh, have we, are we picking up on people who are living together who are claiming benefits separately? Are we picking up on capital? Anyway, we've got the heat map, and what that enables us to do is to target where the biggest um, overpayments are and indeed where the biggest underpayments are. And then there are things we can do about that. So, for example, one of the crucial things in universal credit is we have the data feed from HMRC on earnings. So it enables us to be able to avoid 
under or overpaying people according to fluctuations in but their Peter, earnings. Peter, will you answer Rose's question? Are you on target? How much have you saved this year of that 1.3 billion, and how much next year? Is it going up to what proportion of 1.3 billion in the year after? So um, what's this year's record? The well, so, billion savings. So, um, this question. No, it's a, and it's a good question. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, we want good answers, not where we no. have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, so the way we, I, I'm worried this is going to be an unhelpful answer. So that's why I'm sort of uh, slightly no, no, But the way we, are, the way we measure, just to be clear, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the way we measure is by sampling, and we sample on a, a, a twice twice a year. And so we will, we, will, we will know, and I will see the statistics for this year, the preliminary statistics in May. I know it's deeply unhelpful, uh, but, but we'll see the statistics there. And I would hope that we'd start to see some of the effect coming forward. Uh, but the 1.3 billion... So given this universal credit being, ro being rolled out over, what is it, seven years so far, um, on the past year, how much have you saved towards that... 1.3 billion annual reduction in fraud, fraud um, and error on universal credit? Well, as I said to um, Ms. Duffield just a moment ago, the measurement we've done, because we just don't have the volumes coming through at the moment, the measurement we've done is on the manual system, live service, so all we right. don't have... We don't you have, have no data. figures at all to give us? So I don't, have the, I don't have figures to give you on full service. Um, but 1.3 billion is a number that comes out in the business case, and it applies in steady state when we fully rolled out and finished. Oh, fully rolled out. So that's what 2022. 20, uh, so the well, if you look at the, um, I have the NEA report yeah, well, yes here. Yes or no? Is it 2022? You'll be delivering 1.3, but up to then, certainly now you can't give us any figure. So it'll be rising to the point where we have completed managed migration, well, we want which to is know 20, where it's rising from. So where is it rising? Where is it now to rise to? Well, it's a combination. So it's, what so we're doing... It, is there no figure at the moment? Well, we've got the figure for um, the fraud and error on the legacy yeah. benefits. So tax credits uh, and uh, JSA, ESA uh, and housing benefit and income support. But there was a specific target for universal credit. That no, was no, no, Rose's no. question. So yeah, where no. did that and, figure come, come from, I think? And where is it now? You don't know. Where is, it, where is it now? Well, it's, too, it's still too early to say. So I, I told you, the, uh, right, so Chair, that no this answer. would be an unhelpful answer, but we do, we do, the, we do the sampling uh, at particular right. points in the year and we'll publish the data in May. It's been running for seven years. Right, Chris. Thank you, uh, Chair. Mr. Schofield, uh, going to parliamentary answers, you have 4,504 people, full-time equivalent posts, chasing social security fraud. That's ten times more than the uh, minimum wage compliance unit, four times higher than the HMRC wealthy unit. Are you saying to us that, from the answers you've given so far, that we could recommend that you need more staff to chase fraud? Um, well, look, no, we've got... We've, so the way that we chase fraud and error, I mean, there are a number of different things that we do. We do absolutely have investigators who are out there. I mean, the 5,000 number that... Is, is where we are now, is, it, is, is the entirety of, of this. It's not just investigators. Um, but we have people who are investigating fraud, and they are doing, I have to say, they're doing some quite wonderful work. They are uncovering some quite horrendous cases of things like modern slavery, uh, you know, because when you track down uh, people who are defrauding uh, the benefit system, you realise there's an awful lot of unsavoury stuff that's going on here. And I commend... Uh, my colleagues all across DWP who are investigating and tracking this stuff down. As I'm it is chairing quite a review of the Modern Slavery Act for the Prime Minister, will you give us a paper on what you found? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love savings. to. Oh, no, I'd love to, because I'm, I'm, I'm very proud, right. of, I'm very proud yeah. of what we do. No, Rosie, anything else? Um, yeah, I think we just wanted to move on to talking about state pensions and just the sort of error aspect of that. Um, overpayments seem to be at 4.4%. They were up from 4.2% 2016-17. So what's the department doing to ensure that those rates of overpayment don't continue to rise? 
as universal credits roll down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, sorry, excluding state pensions. I was going to say, sorry, I'm, I'm just struggling no, I know, I threw myself there with that question, sorry. State, state, state you, pensions is a remarkably good performance. Did you mention pensions before, <laughs> I know, so it's in I know, my head? I know, sorry about that. Okay. Sorry, so... Yeah, so basically so excluding state, state pensions, pay. we're saying that the overpayments are up at 4.4% from 4.2. So how are we going to kind of stop that rising? Yes, so it goes back to partly my answer to your previous question, Ms. Yeah. Ms. Duffield, which is uh, really uh, starting with uh, what we call heat map. I have a copy of it here, actually, uh, okay. which, is, uh, which is targeting where, where is that 4.4%? Uh, where are the main causes of overpayment and underpayment as well? Look, I mean, it matters for me as just as much uh, that we are uh, finding people who are not claiming the benefits that they should be claiming. So it gives us the opportunity to do that and then we have targeted strategies in each of these areas, particularly those where uh, overpayment or indeed un underpayment uh, is... Because overpayment, I mean, at the end of every overpayment story is a human being struggling to pay back these ridiculous clawed back payments, you know, and ha having all these sanctions, you know, and making life really very difficult for them you know so we need to know that that is yeah. really coming down yeah no look I mean and Nick may want to come in on this as, as well but I mean the um, you're absolutely right I mean at the end of the story on overpayment uh, there is often a very difficult so I talked about modern slavery there may be people who for whom you know we are claiming benefits back and you know and, and that is uh, very difficult for them and so we always make sure uh, that we are treating our claimants with um, absolute sensitivity and awareness of their situation. Not my personal experience, no. I have to say, when I was on no, these benefits. Not Definitely but, not. But Nick, might you tell us how much do you present to Parliament as being written off of overpayments that you can't recover? Um, what's that, what does that figure stand at? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, maybe um, um, Tara wants to explain the, 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 the detailed figures on the, on the overpayments um, that we are writing off. Just in terms of, um, and, uh, in terms of the approach that we are taking, and um, just the approach, Ms. Duffel, that you highlighted, um, if that's okay, Chair, in terms of you know, the critical importance of making uh, the correct payments. Um, and then also how we um, inter you know, how we work with our our claimants. And since uh, since uh, since joining DW, DWP, um, you know, I have been fortunate to be able to go to our the obviously um, our debt um, uh, operations centres and listen to uh, work that advisors are doing well, with claimants. What's the result, though? That's what and, we're after. and I think in terms of the result, um, it. The importance of this underpins that action that we are taking in terms of bringing together all of the people across DWP working on fraud, uh, working on um, fraud, error, and debt into uh, that single fraud and compliance directorate. What we're then uh, also uh, doing is how we make the best use that we can of the real, -times, um, real time uh, earning information that we do have. Uh, from uh, from HMRC and others, and in that case, making use of something called verify earnings and and, and pensions to actually uh, send out alerts when there are changes. Now we need to we need to go further on that, so that's why we are working jointly with the the NAO as well on this strategy. But, but this I think is not this Rosie in my question. We asked uh, how much do you tell Parliament you have to write off. Because it's not recoverable. And in, in terms of the in terms of the losses in the in the that we report in the account, it's um, the figure is around uh, 330 million on our um, uh, overpayments that we are that we are writing so, that we wrote off in 2017-18. On average, each year a third of a billion is written off as not recoverable. Is that right? Do you, to, do you want to go into a bit more detail? Yes, we, uh, it is disclosed in our accountability statement, 330 million last year. That number has been uh, decreasing year on year since 2012. Um, and the reasons why they are written off, for a number of reasons, one is official error, which we don't um, follow up on, and other, um, the other reason is because it's below a de minimis level of £65, right. where it's just not value for money but, to, to But recover. the question, the, the, the statement is, a third of a billion you're asked Parliament to write off, can't recover. Now, all of us have got constituents 
who, on to universal credit, are getting these gigantic sums of having to pay back historic debts. Are you able, Tara or Peter, to give an assurance to the committee that nobody, but nobody, is being asked to repay historic debts that you've already got Parliament to agree to write off? Yes or no? Can you give us that guarantee? If they're already been included within that de minimis level of £65 or under, or official error on legacy benefits, they will not be asked to repay that money. So, so, they, so nobody's being asked to repay the third of the billion Parliament writes off for you so, as lost. So, so that's right. And, and so, the, the, so for, for most of our benefits, if there's a change of circumstance, and the claimant has told us about the change of circumstance, uh, and we haven't done anything about it, and they've carried on getting the benefits, uh, then it's our problem. No, no, what, no, what we're worried about... Uh, that's, but, but that's a very helpful statement. Nigel. Yeah. It's a danger that the presentation you're giving us implies this is all getting better, whereas, sadly, the data shows it's actually getting worse, doesn't it? You're losing more money to fraud and error last year than you were the... or it's a higher percentage than you were the year before. So when you give us this heat map and these glossy strategies, it's, it's all going wrong, isn't it? I mean, I think three years ago you had another glossy strategy and a, something, something you didn't call a heat map. But when are you actually going to get this number going the right way rather than the wrong way? Well, um, I mean, you're right that the number has not been going the right way in recent years. We've been um, working very closely with the National Audit Office um, in terms of how we develop the strategy and the work that we're, we're doing. Um, I mean... The mix, I mean, as we increase the number of people of working age coming into DWP benefits, so the, so the mix changes, and that does make uh, even maintaining the current performance more difficult because um, people coming in from tax credits, for example, are more likely to have had changes of circumstance. So some of the, um, the work we're doing in terms of data and analytics uh, becomes ever more important to stabilise and hopefully in time bring the number down. And also, you know, there is no doubt we are challenged increasingly on fraud, as every other organisation uh, is. We have a cyber resilience centre which is there to help us target um, online fraud. Um, but, you know, the landscape, the mix and the landscape we're facing is difficult. But there is no excuse, Mr Mills, and, the, you know, the focus here is on driving down levels of uh, overpayment, mm. driving down levels of underpayment, but doing it in a very it's just uh, when you, sensitive and appropriate way. When Mr Joycey cites RTI data from HMRC as being the, one of the solutions, you've had that for five years, haven't you? And yet the number's still going up. Okay. You wonder whether that's going to... But I mean, no, I, I, well, um, so it's something that we use in terms of universal credit. And one of the things that we are... The next step... Um, the next stage is, is enabling that RTI data to be used in a more effective way at preventing fraud and error uh, and overpayments indeed, indeed underpayments, before they happen. So we've had it so you can run a match, run a scan after the event and sort of spot where it's happened. But what we're now introducing is sort of alerts so you can get the information, the change yeah. of circumstance as it happens. So it enables you to stop it happening before before it's occurred, prevention rather than detection. So, in so terms I mean. of legacy benefits or non-universal credit ones, I mean, would, do you have a target for how much you can get fraud, claimant error, and official error down to by benefit, or do you just measure this at a macro department level? Well, we've we've got the targets for the current year of um, of one point five percent. That's on a net basis. But per individual benefit, do you have a target? No, we, we don't have a target, but we do have a Why? focus. Well, because, um, uh, and with some of the things we're working with the National Audit Office on, actually, is um, uh, we've, taken a, we've taken a targeted approach to how we measure benefits, and some of the benefits we do sampling more regularly than, than others. But you have a heat map. What's the point of a heat map if you don't focus on the hotspots? Oh, sorry, that's what I'm saying. We are. <laughs> that's exactly But surely what you for. must have a heat map which says we oh, yeah. no, we've got it. So, yeah, I, th vulnerable. I think, Mr Mills, I'm pushing back on the question of have I got a sort of a target for what I want. I mean, I'd love all the red areas to become green. Uh, I'd love us to get these numbers down. I don't yet have a target, in part because... And this was a debate that um, I was pushed on with the Public Accounts Committee back in May, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And in part, my hope and belief is that as we make more use of data and analytics, 
So the point where, I mean, my ultimate focus is that we get to the point where we've, you know, we get to the point where if we were to spend a pound more, we've done so much that if were we to spend a pound more on prevention, we wouldn't deliver a pound less in savings. So you push this to the maximum point where it is value for money. And then I will go to Sir Amos Morse, uh, or potentially his successor, if I'm not in time, well, successor, uh, successor. <laughs> uh, and say, you know, you know, you have qualified our account since 1980 something or other. Uh, now is the time not to qualify our accounts. I'd love to be the first accounting officer not to have qualified accounts on that basis. It's just, I mean, we sit here and we would like more money to help vulnerable people, and yet we still see 3.7 billion being, you know, lost on fraud or error. So this is, I mean, this is really serious amounts of money we're talking about and the potential to use that for what Parliament yeah, votes it for rather than yeah. stuff it doesn't vote it for. So I just wonder why you can't say housing benefit, you know, the total fraud in there last year was 1.5 billion. We can get that down to, realistically, we can get that down to 1 billion. I know that the numbers will fall, as you see. I just don't understand why you don't set a target per benefit so we can measure what your progress is by benefit and then we can understand where there are real problems. I just... Is that something that you do internally that you just don't want to release in case one goes up and one goes down and you want to smooth it out for us or something? No, no, that's, that's not my motive. My, it's more a sense we, so we brought this together with a team, we've got a strategy, we've got this focus, I'm giving it's the team working, the strategy. I'm giving the <laughs> that's the problem. It's going the wrong way. Well, it is, but, it, but as, a, as, as the We control- all have targets, don't we? I mean, every week I meet with my colleagues, my staff, uh, people working with them, and we set what we're doing the following week. It gives all sense of purpose. Oh, yes. I mean, if I, if I was a fraud officer with you, I know it's all very, very important, but I wouldn't have a target. Well, so I, there is, a, as I, I said earlier, there is. didn't have a target, so what? There is, an, there is an overall target, but what I'm asking my team to do is within each of these areas, tell me how far you can go, develop your strategy in each of those. Each of those um, um, uh, areas in the matrix, if I can call it that way, and then on the back of that, then we then we're in the world where I can set them uh, internal um, uh, have an internal discussion about what could be delivered uh, and what could be delivered by when and what's required to enable them to get there. Whether it be access to data, whether it be uh, you know resource, whatever it is. But uh, but you know we have an overall target. And uh, and that is our okay, so how, just as a final question for me, how resilient are all your systems for all these legacy benefits that presumably you're not expecting to still be using in a couple of years' time? I mean, are you still investing in them and making sure you've got people that can repair them when they go wrong? Are you just sort of a bit on a wing and a prayer now that they'll keep working and we can stick some foil in the fuse box if they really go wrong? I mean, are you sure that these are resilient a, that they're going to keep effectively paying the benefits they need to pay, but B, aren't getting more and more vulnerable to fraud and mistakes as we move on. Well, you are right that we have potentially the largest, most complex uh, system of uh, technology of any organisation in, in Western Europe, potentially, I suppose. Uh, and some of these systems have been built up over a period of years. You know, there's one system I know you can date back to the 1970s. So there are a number of things we're doing. Uh, in terms of, I mean, universal credit has been our opportunity to clear afresh and to build something uh, from the start on solid ground with modern technology. Uh, for other systems, we've been doing a lot of work to migrate uh, the way that the systems are hosted. So we're moving them to uh, cloud hybrid hosting, uh, which enables, um, reduces the cost, but improves the resilience and enables us to add uh, more up-to-date applications onto them. And I suppose our oldest, you know, the, um, the virtual machine environments on the mainframes, uh, we are uh, we are in the process, uh, there's a program called the, the VME Remediation Program, which is, we're towards the end of that, which is all about moving that into a more modern uh, set of, of processes that enable us to be resilient going forward. So it's work in progress, but it's but we are a long way through saving money but importantly, improving resilience and uh, performance. All right, Steve, uh, Ruth and Steve. 
Okay, thank you. So, <coughs> levels of fraud and error under universal credit are still a lot higher than they were um, looking to be. And now you're looking at carer's allowance, we understand, from there was an article in The Guardian um, a week or so ago saying that the department are looking to go back over five years with presumably of real-time information on earnings and look at uh, carer's allowance in comparison to that. Is, is that article correct? Um, well, as with all of our um, systems, we're using real-time information. Uh, all of our benefits, we're using real-time information to enable us to go back and look at where there has been potential levels of overpayment and to go back and address them. So this is, this is one of the things we're using the real-time information to help us do. Okay, and on carer's allowance, there's obviously um, a cliff edge, um, which is dissimilar to many of the other uh, benefits. And claimants who earn just a pound over that cliff edge um, are then ineligible um, for carer's allowance. And I used to work with the retail sector where we had many, many carers who were doing part-time work. If they got a 2% wage rise, they could in inadvertently go above the uh, earnings threshold for carers' allowance. How much of the estimated fraud and error uh, do you think is down to claimants inadvertently earning too much? Well, you see, one of the things, one of the great advantages of real-time information, and remember what I was talking about earlier in my answer to Mr. Mills's question, uh, was around the opportunity to use real-time information, not to do the, not necessarily to do the detection so much, but to get on the front foot and do the prevention. So we're able to pick up on changes of circumstance. Uh, but this on. is going back. This no, is going is. back. And, and, and this is why, and, and you know, and we forward. increased back in April. We increased that threshold by. 3.4%, which is above uh, earnings uh, growth. Um, but um, when we, for all our benefits, we're very clear with people that you know they are making the claim and it's their responsibility. I know we need to, and we want to do this as sensitively as possible, but it is their responsibility to keep us up to date with changes in circumstance. Now, our data matching, but increasingly our data alerts can help us uh, but we do need um, claimants, as with all benefits, to tell us about changes of circumstance. Once they've told us about change of circumstance, you know, on something like carers, carers allowance, it's then our, you know, it's then, and we haven't picked it, picked up on it, then it's an official error, and we don't recover. Uh, but um, but it is their responsibility, and I know this is difficult. Uh, but we have to balance, and this is constant balancing act. Believe me treating people sensitively, and I really want to do that, but at the same time it is their responsibility uh, to tell us, because for all the reasons that you've just been, or colleagues have just been asking me about in terms of the overall levels of fraud and error, I do have to look to recover overpayments where we haven't been told in advance on something like carers allowance. But there's many people who will get a small uh, pay rise and will simply not notice um, and under carers allowance there's so many different deductions the actual calculation of the earnings threshold is a very complicated mm. process that it's actually very hard to find out how to do that um, how much leeway is the department going to give to people who have inadvertently gone above that threshold over the last five years because you can see that they would think that it was incredibly unfair for people in their position who've given up at least 35 hours of, of the week, most of their waking time of their lives, yes, to yeah. care for somebody, saving the state an absolute fortune, around about 15 billion a year, uh, is saved by unpaid carers. Um, and now that the department is looking to go back on them because they had a 2% pay rise. Um, well, I mean, I mean let, me, let me say we massively, I'm just to sort of endorse one of your comments there, uh, Ms. George, about the vital contribution uh, that many of these uh, recipients of carers' allowance are making to our country, and we really uh, absolutely appreciate that. Um, we've increased the threshold by 3.4%. 
so that is ahead of earnings. So that should pick up on the situation where How someone clear has had was that? Sort of was every individual claimant of carer's allowance written to about that increase in the earnings threshold, told how to calculate it, and told very clearly that if one of their pay packets went above that thresh the weekly threshold, um, or the monthly one, because obviously it's difficult for people to work out where it's like where they're paid on a monthly basis, uh, how that relates to a <coughs> weekly threshold. Was that all made completely clear to them? Um, look, I appreciate the question, and we would have told. Was that yes about, or no? Well, well, so these are. The, I mean, uh, was each was each claimant of carers' allowance written to about the increase in the threshold no. and informed yes no. about that at that threshold yes, and how it was how they should calculate it themselves and what they should do? We will have we will have written to everyone, but let me tell you what. Why would it be helpful for the committee if I just checked exactly the, the basis on which we would have alerted people? Mm. Well, I would say two things. One is at the point where a claim was made, we would have been absolutely clear about the responsibility for the claimant to keep us up to date with changes of circumstance. Uh, and I'm pretty but sure. A change of circumstance is not getting a pay rise of a pound a week. A change of circumstance is a change in earnings. Absolutely. Um, amongst other things. Uh, we would have made people them. who have fluctuating yeah, we earnings well, as well. well. It's, 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 it's we would have been clear, but why don't you should I, should I write to the committee on the first Can we wait for your, for your letter? Because it looks as though you haven't. Um, could well, I, no, no, otherwise I, you could have told us immediately. Well, when, yeah, n n you could have said yes. Well, I but think we would have... I think we will check. I, I will check. I think we will have written. Right. Uh, but, but in terms of precisely how... I mean, there were a number of parts to Ms George's question and precisely how we would have addressed those. Let right. me write to the committee. And okay. could, could this committee ask that account will be taken of the amount of information that claimants had, how clear it was to them throughout their claim, um, because it, they might have started make, claiming carers' allowance a considerable time ago, what their uh, responsibilities were around the earnings threshold, how it was calculated, and that that will be taken into account in any seeking of, of repayments that the department make going back. Well, Look, absolutely, it, it matters to me that we treat our claimants as sensitively as possible, balancing our responsibility to the taxpayer as well. So let me address that point as well. They make they, a huge contribution uh, to the taxpayer. Sorry, I, I, I absolutely agree with what you just and said. And even our taxpayers, there is a false yeah. distinction in what you've just said between taxpayers and claimants. Uh, so many of the claims yeah. are taxpayers. But sorry, that's a very fair know, point, Mr Coyle. Thank many, you. many, if not all of these carers, at the end of the day, are just whacked out. Yeah. Yeah. The idea they're going to get down to <laughs> understanding what you mean by this, that, and the other. I know. Is I, know, really I, know I, I understand the committee's point. Yeah. All right, really good. Steve? Can, oh, sorry, yes? could I just ask one other question? Yeah. This committee recommended in our report on, uh, on carers in work that there be um, a tapered threshold for earnings under carers', carers allowance. Would that oh, make no it problem. easier to to avoid the high levels of fraud and error that have been estimated in carers' allowance? Uh, it's a good policy challenge. So we, I, I, I'm aware that is a recommendation of the committee. Will you write to us on that? Uh, yes, I have to write could, to you on could that. Could you let us know what yeah. you think the effect would be on, on fraud and error estimates yeah, under good. carers' allowance, please? Gosh, OK. Well, let me see what I can do. That would be a really yeah. good answer. Yes. Steve? Thank you. Well, we've been discussing overpayments. I, I want to focus briefly on underpayments, sure. which I understand are currently running at £1.7 billion. Yeah. Now, £470 million of that is accounted for by official error and £140 million through claimant error. How do you explain the other billion? Uh, so the numbers for, for underpayment should be a combination of official error and... Yeah, but if I add together the figures that were given to the Comptroller uh, Comp and Auditor General, that accounts for uh, 470 million through official error and 140 million through claimant error. So I'm saying... That leaves a billion unexplained. I'm just wondering if you could explain that. No, Quite a I lot of money, are, obviously. I think the numbers are... Um, yeah, I think the numbers are... Claimant error is 1.1 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, that is underpayment. Yeah, 1.1 billion, and official error is 0.5 billion. Ah, so are you saying that the 
the Comptroller and Auditor General's uh, report in the Department's accounts are wrong? No, they're almost. Well, they're certainly not wrong, uh, but there may be just some. Well, there's something wrong here because you can't make these two figures that way. Wait, I'm not. I'm no, no, just num- reading sorry, what the, it tells me. No, no, me. no. You're saying, Mr. McCabe, the numbers I've just given you are, are from our annual report and accounts, which has okay. been. Audited these are the two seven, the These are the same 2017-18 reports. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, sorry, our numbers have been audited by the NAO as well. I'm just trying to. Can you mind me? Is yours? Is your number from the? Um, I mean, I should. Talk, I can talk to Amos to find out exactly which. Where his number. Well, it says from. here. Let me just read it to you. It says, of the total 1.7 billion of underpayments, official error makes up 470 million. The department classes as claimant error 140 million. Now. By a simple bit of arithmetic, you told us you were still quite hot on that earlier. By a simple bit of arithmetic, you can work out there's a billion unexplained. And I'm just trying to find what that explanation is. But the explanation, and it's not satisfactory, is it? And I appreciate that. But the numbers are the numbers that I've given you from our audited accounts. So I'm just trying to... I'm okay. really well, sorry should we leave that on one side and exactly. maybe you um, could find an explanation if it is the numbers are wrong? But, but I mean... Okay. And I, and I, 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 I write an explanation Please agreed with Amy. Uh, from the Comptroller and Auditor General. That is the National Audit Office. So it's, we're talking about the same person. I know, who has office, audited our other number. Looking at the same figures. Well, well so, I mean, so, sorry, it, let, let, if it can't be explained now... I'll take it away. I'll take it away, we, I'm It's sorry. here in yeah. the open. Let's yeah. see if we can get I'll an explanation. Can I just ask, I noticed you said earlier that you brought your fraud and error yeah. people together. What, what proportion of resources do you devote to identifying and rectifying underpayments as compared to preventing and pursuing overpayments? Well, there's a lot of focus now in in a number of different ways. So there's a particular targeted effort right now on a particular area of underpayment. But if you've brought them together, what proportion do you devote to identifying and rectifying underpayments? as opposed to the other. Well, it's difficult because it's the same team that look at the same piece so of you, work. So is the answer we don't know? Well, the answer is that, 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 um, that all the 5,000 people who work in this area are working on both, but in addition, I have a further 400 people who are working on rectifying underpayments in ESA from the migration from incapacity benefit to would, ESA. Would, would it be possible and, for you to check what proportion of the people you've brought together are working on rectifying underpayments as opposed to chasing overpayments. Would that be something you could provide? You can't do it now, I accept. Well, I, is it something it's just, you could? I'm not sure that I necessarily check. So I don't want to be unhelpful. Um, but I'm not sure I necessarily check with an analyst how much, whether they clock on in the morning and say, right, to, for the first so, hours. So am I right to assume that we spent a lot of time talking about overpayments this morning. Am I right to assume that it's not possible for the department to give the committee a view on what proportion of its resources are devoted to rectifying underpayments as opposed to chasing overpayments. Is that the conclusion? No, it's well, it's not really. I mean, I would love well, to. What is the to, answer? I'm well, lost. You know, I'm trying. Well, Peter, well, let's so say that, you've got a hundred staff yeah, doing yeah. this. Well, the, du- the double task. Yeah, yeah. uh, how many of them are actually? Um, fraud officers who okay. actually go there That's to catch the, the thieves, and how many of that hundred are actually their main function? Though they may find fraud, their main function is to get people to claim benefits to which they're entitled and they haven't claimed. So we have fraud. You're right. We we have fraud investigators. I think that's about. I mean, I'll double check. I think it's about two thousand of the five thousand of fraud investigators. And the other three thousand. And, and all of the others. The others will be a main combination. The is to actually find underpayment. No, it's to do both. I would say that they spend their time uh, pretty evenly on both. But then, in addition, I've got four hundred people who are working on ESA underpayments. So that's in addition, outside of that team, and I've got a further. Um, I think it's around 600 who are looking at underpayments on PIP. So, so that is in addition. So and you've got about, you've got about a thousand people yeah. on PIP. So how many, again, again, could we just set those yeah. figures up? How many specifically, it doesn't mind about the benefit, are looking at underpayment? Nothing to do with fraud. What's the number in the department? 
Uh, so 400 on ESA, and, and I think it, I think it's 600 yeah. on PIP. So we've got a thousand who are specifically looking at underpayment. Who are looking on the under? Well, those are particular exercises. Yeah. As to a deal with a legal action against the department to force the department to pay back what was owed to disabled people on this area particular, you're including that group. Um, so on ESA, on ESA I've, I did a long hearing with the Public Accounts Committee where we talked through what had happened in terms of ESA yeah. um, and, and actually what happened on ESA is we picked up underpayments through our analysis of the fraud and error and underpayments data. Yes, but so our analysts like picked it up and we took action. We are looking at how, we, how you value both tasks. Now and so we've got a, hun we've got a thousand hmm. whose specific duty is underpayment, though they may find fraud. Then we've got 5,000 fraud officers. No, 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 no. well that's not me. what I said. And, and I should double check the numbers, but we have 5,000 people who work for the Director of Counter Fraud yes. and Compliance, uh, brought them all together, of whom a large proportion, I think the number is 2,000, I should double check, are fraud investigators. Well, I think, um, I think well, it would be nice if the numbers could be checked uh, for this, because obviously it is a matter of concern, because I'm right to say at the moment underpayments are running at their highest uh, level ever. Uh, the higher, higher, highest estimated level ever, is that right? So we're at uh, about 1% at the moment. At 1%, well, I think you're at 2%, 1%, aren't you? Uh, no, we're not. Um, well, so, so the we're 1 Comptroller so and Auditor General's got that wrong as well. He says here, <laughs> sorry about this, he says, excluding state pensions, the estimated level of underpayments has increased to 2%. That's where the 1.7 billion comes from. That's against your target of 0.9, isn't it? Has he got that wrong as well? No, no, no. 1.7 billion is 1%. Uh, the target is against all our benefits, not excluding state Well, he does say, it does say yeah, 2%. No, 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 no. And to be fair to the controller and Auditor General, that's what he says too. So I don't think we're, we're disagreeing on that. Look, I think ESA is a... Ex well, I think is there a, is, is a, a disagreement if one person saying 1% one and the other person saying 2 No, it's not, because as you read out, Mr it's McCabe, I think you read out his 2% was looking at all of our benefits excluding the state pension, uh, whereas the 1% is as a proportion of all our benefits, including... Oh, the you pension. include the state pension? So, so that, that's the point. I but I just think, look, I, I think the ESA is a case in point here. We picked up... Through our analysis of the data, we picked up that there was a large number of people who were being underpaid on ESA. It then it was the trigger course, for us to go back and look at what had gone on. I have now have 400 people whose job is going through, trawling through something like, at the moment, first instance, 325,000 cases of people who have moved across from incapacity benefit to ESA, where we move them, we might have moved them incorrectly into the con contribution-based ESA, not the income-related ESA. And we are going through that methodically. I've sat with colleagues as they have taken details with claimants uh, some of them very vulnerable claimants on the phone trying to get through and get through to pay these people what they're owed. I take this incredibly seriously, as do my team, and that is why I'm putting the resource onto this. So, you know, if the committee wants assurance that we take this seriously, yeah, you can take it from the Permanent Secretary great. that we've done. Okay. Uh, yeah, but, no, 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 before, no, Neil, before yeah. that, we're coming to you. Yeah. Can I just ask uh, one last thing then? I mean, uh, I'm not doubting that you treat it seriously, I'm just wondering if we can get a, a full picture, but can you tell me about underpayments, particularly with universal credit, and I'm interested in the self-employed in particular. Do, do you know what rate that's running at and what particular action team you've got working on that? Um, well, I go back to my point in answer to Mr... I can't remember who asked me the question now around universal credit, fraud and error and underpayment pay data. At the moment it's still early days because we've been measuring uh, the live service rather than the digital service. But we'll have more information on this in May when we publish the next set of, set of statistics. So if I take delivery of a question, uh, Mr McCabe, in terms of understanding the self-employed, let me, let me see what we can do uh, in the light of the numbers in May, whether we're able to give you an answer on that. I'll take the, the point the committee are interested in. Okay. Neil, and then Ruth. Yeah, sure. So um, the OBR... 
describe the monitoring and forecasting architecture of universal credit as less than ideal, which is uh, diplomatic speak for not good enough at best. Um, so how have those concerns been addressed? And what information has been given to the Treasury to show it's been addressed? And what changes have been made? So we do um, a huge amount of work, and we're right in the middle of it right now in terms of the process of supporting the OBR in terms of their fiscal forecasts. And we have a, uh, and this has become tighter uh, every fiscal event, we have a set of forecasting rounds where we go through, we look at um, what we can see in terms of caseload mix, what we can see in terms of any policy changes that have impacted, any impact of the uh, econ economy, uh, economic growth. Uh, and we do that in an open book way with the Treasury and we present jointly to the OBR uh, so that the figures that uh, are published by the OBR are based on the best possible data. So we have, we have tightened and we've improved all of that. In addition to that, we've introduced new governance over the way that we monitor and pick up our AMI forecasting, so AMI, sorry, um, our benefit spending, uh, which we do uh, jointly, uh, chaired by director generals from uh, DWP with uh, senior folk from the Treasury there as well. So we have, we have, a, we have a stronger process for working with the OBR and we have very tight and open governance so it's all done in a very open way with the Treasury so hopefully that is So what, what, what's the specific change within be it Amy or whatever, you, you give an example of what, what you have done to address that specific uh, criticism that it's just not good enough and um, you're saying you're working better with the OBR, that doesn't give me an answer to the question um, Okay, so uh, I think in terms of universal credit I think it's just about the, it's not really about changing the way we forecast, it's about the way that we uh, share data and are working closely together through every step of the process. Uh, an, an, but an example, which I think would be a different example, would be the way that we are forecasting personal independence payments. Well, we're we're actually, about uh, yeah, credit. specifically about universal credit. And you're saying you're sharing information differently with OBR, but they're saying that the monitoring and the structure of universal credit and your predictions are not good enough. So how does just giving them, them a bit more information prove that you are getting better at monitoring and forecasting within universal credit? Um, well, I think the two go very closely together, and let's see what they say after the change in process that we currently have. I mean, I'd, I'd be keen to see what they think in the light of the, the, the process that we're in underway. I've heard no complaints so far from the OBR uh, in terms of the current Did way that we're working. Did you have complaints before last year, then? Uh, oh, no. I don't. I don't remember any complaints. That's no, a very. But that's, still a, that's, that's a very good yeah. and, and, <laughs> fair and, challenge. And let's, and let's be clear. Uh, but, but, but look, I mean, and, and we'll we'll review with them at the end of the process. Uh, but it makes the whole done. of their analysis yeah, yeah. for Palms and the country less valid. If you know, Mrs. If, T once said, "You put rubbish into a commuter computer, you get rubbish out." Now here are these people trying to build up really <coughs> important predictions how the economy is working. And they're saying we find this really difficult because DWP in this respect gives us rubbish. And so we feed it into the uh, computer and get rubbish out. I don't think they're quite putting it that way. Uh, well, I'm, just, but, I'm uh, just helping them. Express <laughs> more clearly yeah. the difficulties they face. No, I let, <coughs> let me take, we take this seriously and we're working closely. And I mean, I don't, I don't think... I think so there, are some, wrote, there are some changes. If we wrote to Robert Chote, yeah. would he say, God, they've, they've improved? I do hope so, but I mean... Well, I think we might do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and okay. Can, 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 I, can I ask is, him first? Well, there is... <laughs> there is well, I know you're a good old trade union. You're, you're a lovely like billion. But anyway, come on. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's eight, 8 billion uh, estimated um, uh, you know, uh, net annual benefit of, of universal credit that the National Audit Office has said remains unproven. The case for that remains unproven. So you're saying it will get more people into work hmm. when there is absolutely not a shred of evidence or any way of measuring whether, whether universal credit makes that difference now. Um, the costs of uh, administering the new process are still massively problematic and out of sync from where they should be. Uh, the number of people on it is 10% of what it should be. And you've already confirmed today that still less than half the people who are meant to be uh, verifying online cannot do it. So uh, where, where is that 8 billion coming from? 
Well, the eight billion is set out, I think, very clearly in the NEO report. But let it, me. It says unproven. Well, so I mean, you, there are a number of component parts to your question. So the two hundred thousand extra people in work. The um, and then we had this. I, had, I mean, we could play a debate I had at the Public Accounts Committee at the beginning of July on this uh, very number. They're not saying uh, that um, they don't think that number is going to come through. What they're saying is it's very, very difficult to measure it because you don't have a counterfactual. Uh, that is, that's a point that they're making, but they haven't challenged the 200,000 as a number in the business case. And it is based on uh-huh. the evidence. Stick a finger in the air. No, no, it's based, well, it's, uh, I do have the NEA report here, and I could uh, take you to the relevant bits, uh, but it does uh, look at some of the evidence that's coming through about the way in which universal credit is encouraging more people to look for work, that it is enabling more people to increase their hours, uh, and compared to job seekers' allowance, uh, the, the, um, the proportion of people who are finding work in universal credit is higher. So this committee has asked for extra evidence provided. A further survey to be undertaken from the start of this year was what I think we asked for uh, on how universal credit support people to work. Why has the department failed to bother to do any of that if you're so confident that that's still part of the picture for the 8 billion? I think that's, I think that's un- to be fair, Mr. Cole, I think that's unfair. I mean, we published in June a proposal for how we're going to do this, call for evidence, a, approach to how we're going to work uh, to develop the evidence base. Um, it, it, is, the, it is difficult to measure account against the counterfactual when we have rolled out universal credit everywhere. So that's the, that's the challenge. But we have, as you, you'll see from the document that we published in June, we have a strategy for how we're going to approach this. Uh, and we're doing this in, an, in a very, uh, very open way. But no one has challenged the basis of the 200,000. The challenge from the NAO is, is around whether you can measure it or not. Uh, and I understand the challenge. I say it was a debate I had at the Public Accounts Committee at the beginning of July. Um, well, on if the we can't measure it, we just could make up any of it. No, so that's not a million. <laughs> mm-hmm. no, that's not the point, though, is it? When you have a business case, you have the business case assumptions have to be based on evidence. And the evidence is set out in the NEA report and more fully in the business case itself, which the Treasury have been through, uh, and they are they have approved it uh, as well. But can, so, we, can we come back to the bit the department yeah. actually is a focus up? So, so yeah. tell us about the IT costs. Tell us about the real-time information collection and the problems there, because we know, I mean, that group, what's it called, the late uh, missing and something else uh, initiative with, with HMRC? We know there's problems there. The landlord portal will never cover 20% or something of private landlords. Um, Tell us about the cost of ministry, the unit costs, where, where that's at now, because these are the bits that you are directly responsible for, whether people go into work or not, let's leave that to one side for now. Yes, I mean, I, on unit costs, I think I gave the committee an answer a bit earlier in the session. Uh, 699 yeah. is the number at the time, well, the it's NA, the number in the yeah. NA report, yeah. we're on about 545 now. Um, we would like it to be around 505 at this point, but we made a decision to recruit work coaches ahead of plan, so they're in post, so it does include the over-recruitment. But it is going down steadily, I mean, I think more than steadily, it's just in the period that we've been uh, talking about. But, you know, fundamentally, universal credit is a benefit that we are rolling out as, and testing and learning as we go. So it's, it's what they call agile, but what it means is that we are, uh, as we go along, we are learning all the time and we are improving the system as we go along. And one of the things the NEO brought out of what very clearly was the feedback loop uh, in the system. So, and I sit with work coaches uh, who tell me about suggestions that they have fed up through the system uh, and which have then been incorporated into a, into a release in terms of the change of the system going forward. So the feedback loop works. And that is the basis on which we're on which we're rolling it out. And how much has been spent to date on universal credit implementation? Uh, well, the numbers are in the NAO report. Uh, yeah, but you've given us the updated figures where you're proud. Let's have the figure for the overall spend. Uh, the overall spend. Uh, there's no there's no change in the in the assessment, and we'll, we'll end up spending just under two billion in total, which is what where we were in the 2015 business plan. Of course, Ruth. But. Okay. Eight billion of, of uh, net savings uh, or economic benefits year by year in steady state. 
Well, we might come back and probe that mm -hmm. in a correspondence with it. Largely due right. to... Eight people in a steady state, a very interesting yeah, bit Largely due to cuts. Mm. Um, just on your previous point about test and learn, Neil Cooling mm. told this committee there are about 200 fixes to the computer system for universal credit that still need to be made but that are backing up and that fixes that many people um, in the House consider quite urgent, such as the ability to split payments within universal credit, are not being prioritised uh, within the next two or three years. Why are you not coming to, the, uh, to your Secretary of State and asking for additional money within um, the computer system to enable those fixes to be made so that universal credit can work properly before rollout exceeds any further? Okay, so um, so the fixes, the variety of fixes within that, and some are suggestions coming, as I said earlier, from frontline colleagues who have proposals for. But they're not being done because well, no, they're, we're, we're we've working. been told that the computer fixes aren't happening. Well, they are. Every two weeks, we release new uh, new changes to the system to improve things. Um, one of the, the, okay, the I'm, I'm sorry, conscious of your time, that mm. but Ruth. Um, Shall I just you, you give us a note on that, will you, about this role? Well, I can do. I was going to answer the specific question there about um, would it help to have more resources? And, and by and large... Um, You've told us. The Secretary of State's got to go and argue for no more resources. Sorry, on, on the particular point of... Oh, well, look. I mean, uh, All right. Very good. Really? Right. Sorry, OK. On another issue, we've got... Uh, not your responsibility, I know, but we've got tax credit debts uh, and overpayments that are racking up hugely since the reduction in the excess earnings limit from £5,000 a year down to £1,000 a year. It's obviously meaning that the previous year estimates of tax credits are largely incorrect and that's building up. I think we're on about £5.9 billion of overpayments on tax credits now, which will be transferred over uh, to the department as uh, as rollout continues. Um, <coughs> what's your? Have you developed a forecast for your debt recovery for those tax credit overpayments? Oh, well, uh, Tara might want to, or Nick might want to uh, come in on that. Um, but um, I mean, this point was covered in some detail in the NEA report, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, and, and the, the, the challenge, I think, for us is developing systems that enable us to manage an increase in debt as it comes across and to do that in a very uh, sensitive way. One of the reasons for the increase in debt from last year, the debt stop from last year to this year, is indeed some of the early uh, amounts of tax credit debt coming over with some of the first people uh, to move across uh, on a natural migration from tax credits. But, um, I mean, Tara, do you that's, want to address the point? I mean, I, th <coughs> I, th I, th I think that's probably sort of adequately addressed, uh, addressed the point. That's okay, okay. thank you. Right. So, sorry, Tara. Um, we've heard from Resolution Foundation that uh, 3.2 million families who have been on tax credits will be £2,500 a year worse off under universal credit, uh, which will obviously impact on their ability to repay historic debts. Um, <coughs> You're assuming in your universal credit business case that the department will be able to recover debt at the same rate as through tax credits. Have you had a look at that in the light of the, um, of the uh, Resolution Foundation and other figures in the absence of a proper impact assessment for the new rates of universal credit? Um, well, the thing about a lot of the analysis that's done is it's a sort of static analysis which doesn't take account of the behavioural change. So the way that as you improve a system, make a system uh, incentivise work, make it easier for people to seek work and get more hours in work, getting rid of things like the 16 hour rule, the way that that changes people's ability to find work and that what that does to incomes. So we found... But if you're working less than 16 hours a week then you don't have the ability to pay back very large amounts of debt. But you won't be on um, working tax credit then, will you, in that situation? No, if you're on universal yes. credit, unable, unable to claim, that's what you said, people will be better off. Oh, sorry, the, I thought you were talking about jobs. people who came over with tax credits. <coughs> tax credits. Well, you're, you're saying that people will be better off because they can get mini-jobs. 
Um, okay, so well, if we're, so if we're looking, they've obviously had a change so, of circumstances okay, if well, they've come from tax no, but, credits. Sorry, there, there are a range of things that are happening. For, this is why you know um, this is part of the business case and, and the, the merits of universal credit is partly about. Uh, what it does in terms of enabling people wherever they are, you know, if they are not in work, to look for work. Um, I met a claimant uh, last week who um, told me her story of how she had, because universal credit didn't have the sort of 16 hour rules and all the various ups and downs, she could just focus on moving into finding hours. Working. Uh, it's all right. We, we've had we have this from ministers and from Neil okay. Cornyn. Well, I'm, we, I'm just giving an example of where it has helped people into work. Um, the other thing, though, I think that really matters is that by removing the complexity, you make it easier for people to get access to the benefits to which they're really entitled. They only have to make one claim, and then we can make sure that they get, you know, the housing benefit. And maybe they weren't claiming the child. Uh, uh, childcare uh, support that maybe they weren't getting before, and that is an important part of the overall story. But has the re did resolution take into account all these extra money people will get when it's stated how many millions would be worse off gross when they go over uh, to universal credit? I mean, I guess that's a question that you have to ask them, but I do think it didn't, uh, it was a um, a static analysis is in my reading of it rather than a dynamic one that takes account of the way people's people behave differently and may, might be more likely to get a job and, and progress in work uh, under universal credit. Okay, well in order to analyse that, when will the department be publishing the full impact assessment and an equalities impact assessment on universal credit? Um, well, tomorrow, no. won't it, after the day's work? <laughs> <laughs> um, is it ready? Is it ready for us, <laughs> Ruth Sarskin? <laughs> um, Let's see what happens this afternoon. Um, the, um, but obviously, when we publish the regulations, there'll be the normal impact assessment alongside it. All so right. The Can I just ask two very quick questions? Uh, will that, Im so I'm Sorry, just say, will that impact assessment be of the regulations, or will it be of universal credit, credit. as a whole? Mm -hmm. Of the regulations. And the yeah, that's separate. Ruth, I think the big one is. Yeah, that's we haven't had one since 2011. About. Yeah. Maybe we should see about it. Yeah, there'll be two, two lots you have to publish. That's good. Right, can I ask a couple of quick questions? Mm. Let's take each hundred people going over to universal credit. Yeah. How many of those hundred get exactly the right benefit to which you don't have to make any other changes and there's no challenge to it at all? It's all gone honky-dory and they, we can say, well done. Uh, so the latest statistic is that we're 83% of people are making new claims or uh, change of circumstances which cause a new claim, get paid the full amount, the right amount, in the first assessment period. And on time? Y y yes, within the first assessment period. So yes, I.e. Five, five weeks? Yes. 82%? 83. It's the very latest. Very latest. So the Conservative MP on, on Channel 4 with me last night was wrong with a figure. Good, all right. That's oh, really? Oh, what, number did he, what number did he or she give? <laughs> we had 90-odd something. Yeah. It depends on what you're measuring. Well, I was measuring uh, but, that. But, okay, well, that is just, well, okay, that's the, the statistic I've given you is the latest statistic no, on that no, particular measure. Good. So in almost sort of 20% don't. Uh, well, 17% yeah. don't, but then many of them, many of them get, and this could be where the 90% number is, I'm seeing the latest, get, um, get most of their number, of the money, so, you know, maybe there's a, an element that they're missing no, because they haven't no. verified housing costs or childcare costs, so we're trying to make that but as straightforward for people as possible. when your salary comes through, it's accurate, isn't it? But we yes. can't keep saying, well, they've got most of it. And most of it, well, us will think that's appalling if the House of Commons didn't pay us properly, or the, the government didn't pay you your salary properly, wouldn't you? Um, Not look, good enough, is it? I want to get I want to get that number up as far as possible, but of course, yeah. some of this relies on the claimant sure. doing it. I mean, you know, you know the system. Yeah. Some of it relies on the claimant producing the verification of particular costs or signing up to their claimant commitment. Well, they yes, well, they wouldn't be included in the figures because they wouldn't be actually being completed, would they? So the, the way we do, the way we calculate this is we look back right. on the, so the 83% is with hindsight looking back on what right. claims came through. Right, so almost 20% don't. Now, you've been very kind to people who don't pay their child maintenance by writing off £2 billion. Now, some of those will be women, but most of those will be men getting away with non-payment. 
and they cannot now have any redress at all. They cannot go into the courts, uh, and you kindly um, said to them, you're two billion worse off now. How could you possibly justify that decision to people, generally women, with children, trying to get their maintenance, mm. um, when there's no recourse at all to the decision you've made? Well, that's not fair to say there's no recourse to where we are. Well, can um, they go to the courts? Are I, you going to give them compensation? No. So let's. Let, sorry, that was, wasn't a no to that answer. Let me. Um, let me. Well, let me. No, let me put it this way. Okay. Are you going to pay them compensation, or you so, just tell them to walk down the street, get on with it? No. So what we're what we're saying to them, we are writing to. So remember, these are very old debts. By and large. Yeah, I know they've been um, suffering a very long time. Some well, way and a lot of, that information. Well, well uh, yes, but a lot of this goes back to the early days of the Child Support Agency, where we know that um, a lot of the calculations were wrong. I mean, this is why those um, accounts have been uh, qualified not just in terms of uh, uh, regularity, but actually in terms of accuracy uh, for many years by the NAO. How many so, of these cases so, but, have but you to, used your powers? to look at what the living standard of the debtor is so, so before you've decided they can't pay. Sorry, I, I was trying to... I mean, the, the key point is that we write to uh, the parents with care before we take any action uh, where the debt is of a scale... I mean, if it's a very small debt that it would cost more to chase up, uh, then, then it's a different story. So you could give them the money for that, couldn't you? Uh, if it's well, no, so we, small... Well, you could, you could no, just that's say, not, right. well, that's not what we're going to do. You're not going to do, no. That, that's not what we're going to do. But, 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 so, so, but, but we write to... you write to me, and I've you know, transferred myself to being a mother and with children, and I write back and say, you shouldn't write off that debt. Yeah. What, what, what are you going to do about it? What we do then is we put it onto the new system and we chase it down. We investigate. So, so there is recourse. Hmm. They can go onto the new system. Yes. Well, I think there'd be a lot of mums out there with children who've got these letters. We'd be interested to hear from it. Our last question okay. is your, your, yours. I mean, the letter should make it clear. The letter does make no, it clear. Right. right. Well, we'll don't worry, we'll get letters. Okay. People watching will give us letters. Yeah. They're, they're very good. So, thank you. All right, Neil? Yes, yeah, so I think it's the last oh, question. Last um, the, on 27th of June, Neil Cooling told his committee that he didn't receive a bonus or increment or performance related uh, payment uh, last year, but the department's accounts su suggest that he did. Can you tell us um, why the difference and uh, what that extra payment related to? Um, I think there was a particular question about that he was asked. If I remember rightly, uh, about um, the. Um, well, I bonus? should double check the Hansard. I think a particular question about whether there were bonus payments related to particular performance in, in Universal Credit. But I, but I should check it. But, um, well, but you're right, did. on page so 126. He only deals with Universal Credit, doesn't he? Sorry, what's that? When you say relate, uh, well, that, uh, the question was relating to Universal Credit, he's only, he's only got responsibilities for Universal no, Credit. No, sorry, the, the, I think the question was asked in a particular way. That, that's all. I can't. Um, I, I, I have a copy of the question. Okay. On top of your regular salary, are you paid any increments or bonuses linked to Universal Credit delivery? Or is there any performance related element of your salary linked to Universal Credit delivery? And he said. Yeah. There is nothing on top of my salary in that respect, and there is no performance related element. So, what was the bonus for? Uh, so, the bonus, uh, so you're talking about the figure 0 to £5,000 on page 126 of the. Uh, yes, what was it for? Um, well, um, it was for his overall performance during the year. And he's only responsible for universal credit? Which has been a resounding difficulty for you, challenge in in, in diplomatic speech. Not, 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 not at all. If you look at what the national orders, if you look at what the national order office say about universal I'd be credit, if the, any you've heard about underpayments, overpayments, IT system problems, the, the impact it's having on my constituents, and here is someone directly responsible asked if there was a bonus or in, or increment or anything related to universal credit delivery, told us no, told Parliament no, and it turns out there was an extra payment. Let me tell you what the National Audit Office say about universal credit. Um, well, let's not, let's, that, no, because that, that's not linked to the question <laughs> at all. Yeah. Well, it is, it, is, it is because actually we the know, National Audit Office make a lot of... We know what your Secretary of State had to try and defend 
after being briefed about that report. <laughs> Niels is anyway, very Yeah, it was very specific. Wrong. You've answered it. He got a bonus. He told us he didn't. So there's clearly inaccurate, an inaccuracy there. And I, I wonder if there's any powers the committee has to look back into that. But there's also this case of 11 members of DWP staff given exit packages in excess of £100,000. Now, the government has told us they want to have maximum exit payments of 95000 So what's happened there? And where's value for money in this? Uh, well, any payment over over that amount has to be scrutinised by uh, the Cabinet Office. And at, at, at your recommendation, I'm assuming, as Permanent Secretary. So, what was it for? Uh, well, sorry, it's probably happened before I was Permanent Secretary. That's why I'm sort of uh, slightly. Are you saying you don't know? Struggling. So, why don't I write? If you want to know, let me write. Yeah, fine. All down. right. Mm. Um, now, um, before you talk to Neil Cooling. Um, you're going to write to the uh, Robert Choate, aren't you? Before, <laughs> oh, before, right. before he receives our letter. And then you'll talk to Neil and come back to him to, to explain uh, why there's this inconsistency of qu quite a considerable sum of money. Is that all right? Oh, yes. No, yes great. Right. Very good. Well, thank you very much for thank your time today. We're, we're really grateful to you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.